spatial basis. And this will lead us to the frequency distributions, the use of typical meteorological years. Uh, how do we do resource assessment for large projects and measurements? The solar resource enhancement factor, and then we'll go and um, to to the um, more specific things for CSP and CPV, uh, which means, for example, circumsolar irradiance, and mostly for CPV, spectral irradiance, and the use of SMARTS, the uh, spectral irradiance model. For more information, you can uh, click to this uh, link to go to our uh, website. And obviously, uh, some conclusions for these two uh, webinars. Now, the internal DNI variability. Uh, last time we, we looked at the short term DNI variability. Now we looked at the year to year variability. And like in every in everything, there are good years and bad years, of course, and especially for GNI. And this is due to different things like climate cycles, El Nino, La Nina, ch changes in release of natural aerosols, or in, in, that includes, uh, of course, uh, volcanic eruptions, the increase or decrease in pollution, and in the longer term, climate change itself. So we have here, um, see this green arrow now, we have here a plot of uh, measurements that started in uh, 1978 in Eugene, Oregon, and see that it actually started with a bad year, and if you do the um, the, year, the annual average accumulated uh, since 1978, you see that after a few years of uh, global irradiance, about three years of global irradiance measurements, you reach the plus or minus 5% of the long-term average, which is of more than 30 years now. But if you do uh, DNI measurements, direct normal measurements, uh, it takes you <laughs> up to 13 years to reach this 5% of the, the long-term average in DNI. So it means that DNI is a lot more variable and more difficult to measure than global irradiance, and we have to be careful about this. Uh, the solar data from Eugene and a lot of other sites in Oregon and the Northwest US is available from this website. Now, here we have another way of uh, the arrow. Uh, another plot here where uh, it is uh, showing the year-to-year uh, -year variability, the internal variability. Same site, Eugene, and the red curve are, is uh, GNI. The blue curve is uh, global irradiance and you see the kind of variability from year to year. Some of these um, dips here are due to volcanic eruptions, but you have also some kind of trend over the time, and obviously good years and bad years. So, in other words, uh, short measurement periods at a specific site, like one year or less, are absolutely not sufficient for serious resource assessment for large projects in particular. So what can we do? Well, there are special techniques that must be used to correct long-term model data, which are based on satellite imagery, for example, using the short-term measured data you have on this specific site. So the internal variability in DNI is much higher, and I would say at least double, than that, than that in uh, global irradiance, DHI. Uh, this variability is of course higher in cloudier climates, and those uh, cloudy climates uh, result in low uh, Kn, which is the DNI divided by the extraterrestrial normal irradiance. But they are still uh, significant in clearer regions with high uh, Kn uh, ratio. And those, those um, 
So high key, uh, high key N will be on that side of the plot, on the right side, and low key N with very cloudy climates on, on this side here. Uh, and those uh, points here uh, represent the, the, the internal variability measured by the coefficient of variation, standard deviation divided by the mean, uh, for uh, more than 200 sites in the US and that's based on the 30-year data from the from the NSRDB uh, of NREL. So you see the, in the red the DNI variation and in the blue the global irradiance variation. So you see a lot of scatter and uh, obviously the, the coefficient of variation is a lot higher for DNI. So this coefficient of variation is actually only uh, significant at the 60% level, uh, probability level. Uh, that's purely statistics. For bankable 95% probability, for example, you should double these uh, COV results. Now we have um, recent maps uh, available from NREL here with this uh, at this website uh, showing the intraannual DNI uh, coefficient of variation over uh, eight years uh, uh, from the NSRDB, the latest edition of the, of the NSRDB, and this shows that over some regions the, the, the variability is relatively low. In some other regions, and particularly here, it can be very high. And again, this is only at the 66% level, and you should double those values here uh, to obtain 95% probability. All this is um, detailed in, in this uh, article here. Now, the long term variability. Uh, the problem is that we don't know much about the past DNI results because there are only a few sites in the world that have been measuring uh, DNI. So, because the goal of uh, CSP and CPV resource assessment is to obtain projections over the next 20 or 30 years, uh, what can we do? We have now obtained uh, some interesting data from the past and that show that we have um, kind of cycles uh, and they are called brightening or dimming. Uh, so this was an early brightening period until the 1950s followed by uh, some dimming period until the, the 1980s, maybe early 1990s and now again some kind of brightening period again and this shows in the global irradiance data from Germany uh, that could be a little bit different for DNI and obviously for other sites in the world but still uh, this is a, a general situation so one question is uh, will this brightening continue over the next 20 years or so, or will it go again to a dimming phase? Uh, we are not really sure yet. So these long-term trends do not affect the world equally. Uh, here we have uh, some data on the dimming that, that occurs currently in India, for example site you have numbers in person per decade which means 10 years so it can be from let's say um, minus one percent to minus seven percent depending on location uh, per decade so and uh, possibly the trend in DNI can be larger than this so for the moment, uh, we have some brightening in the northern hemisphere, except maybe in Asia, and a dimming in the tropical regions of the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. So for example, India and China are directly affected at this moment by some dimming. And this is most probably because of the current increase in coal burning and pollution, which uh, has been named the Asian brown cloud.
So this situation is actually good news in some areas where there's some brightening and bad news in others. Uh, this plot here uh, shows uh, interesting um, results from models showing, uh, for example, for the period 1950 to 1990, um, where the, the, the dimming occurred. And this was basically everywhere in the world. Now, the period 1990 to 2002, we show a very different picture where there's brightening, especially in the northern hemisphere and Europe, and dimming in other parts of the world, and especially here in Western Africa, India, and China. So, this could be good news actually for. Uh, CSP and CPV, but it could be bad news on a different level for change. So, at this point, uh, most long-term variability results are for global irradiance, GHI. Uh, one difficulty is to transform these results into DNI variability. And there are regions where DNI varies more than GHI, and other regions where the reverse occurs. Uh, this is another plot for different other stations in the world, uh, mostly in uh, Europe or Eastern Europe, and also some uh, results from Japan, so Asia. A as you see there, there's a clear trend. And, and this one is uh, atmospheric transmission, so it will affect DNI and GHI. And another plot here again from uh, stations in Oregon, in the Pacific Northwest, U.S. And you you see again, uh, this is for DNI actually, and you see again a, a, a positive trend or brightening period for all these uh, three sites. Uh, but how will it go in the future? We don't know exactly. So the, the, the unknowns are many. Um, how air quality regulation will uh, or Kyoto type accords uh, will uh, take place? Uh, we assume that air quality actually improvements in Europe, for example, and in Russia have uh, tremendously affected uh, the dimming and, and uh, brightening things. Uh, climate change evolution. Of course, you know, uh, there could be more clouds or less clouds, for example. Uh, another unknown is possible geo geoengineering, which means forced dimming. Uh, some people think of injecting aerosols precisely to decrease the, the global warming. And that could be really bad news for CSP and CPV if they really go along with this kind of initiative. And then volcanic eruptions, you never know when there could be a, a big one. So, in other words, for the next 20 or 30 years, nobody has a definite answer of what will be the situation, or how the trend will, will go. So, there are, uh, we have identified some uh, uh, causes of uh, these uh, trends. Uh, Cloud climatology is one thing. We know that uh, since the uh, mid-80s, the, the cloud cover has decreased over the world. And uh, so obviously that affects uh, both GHI and DNI. Uh, it, we also noticed that the emissions of black carbon from coal, for example, and other aerosols has decreased especially since the, the, the 70s in, uh, in Eastern Europe due to more air quality control and uh, changes in economic uh, patterns. Uh, and then uh, humidity patterns are also involved in this. They are uh, changing. And the consequence of all these uh, dimming and brightening things uh, can be uh, shown here with the uh, change in, in glaciers, for example, in the Alps. So during the dimming phase, uh, 
uh, from 73 to 85, there was a decrease in glacier of about 1% only. But in, during the brightening phase that followed from 85 to 2000, the, the uh, retreat of the glacier was about 18%. So it means that actually the brightening increases the global warming trend. Now let's go to the spatial variability in DNI. Uh, again, this is a map for the US and showing spatial variability. And this is important to consider for two reasons. Uh, in regions of low spatial variability, you can use low res, low resolution resource maps, for example, uh, 100 by 100 kilometer. That can be okay at least for a preliminary design. But conversely, in regions of high spatial variability, you, are, you should only use high resolution maps like 10 by 10 kilometer or better. So it's important to, to go into the details. And a second reason is if the variability is high, the measurement, measured data from nearby weather stations should only be trusted. Uh, so here on this map, we, sh we see that um, very high spatial variability occurs along the western coast of the U.S. Uh, due to a change from maritime weather to very uh, clean and dry weather uh, due to mountains and everything. In many other areas, uh, the spatial variability is relatively uh, limited. So how that was been uh, how, uh, how that was obtained is uh, using this kind of uh, five by five matrix with ten by ten kilometer grid cells, and the center cell was compared to all the other cells around, and that was uh, defining uh, the the spatial variability in terms again of uh, the option of variability in person. So this is for 66% probability, and again, you have to double these results if you, if you need a 95% probability. Daily frequency distributions. Well, most generally, daily frequency distributions are highly skewed. We see here uh, actually two distributions. One is for relatively cloudy maritime weather from Bermuda. And uh, the, the, the annual resource is only in DNI is only 3.8 kilowatt hour per square meter. And compared to a very dry and uh, uh, sunshiny uh, climate uh, in Australia with a a resource of 7.4 kilowatt hour per square meter, and you can see the difference in frequency distribution. One important thing to note is that um, at, at very high DNI sites like uh, Alice Springs in Australia, you have the most typical uh, days of the year, which is represented by this uh, modal value. Uh, these days provide much more direct energy than the average, the mean value, which is about here. So uh, this, uh, obviously, this uh, behavior is reversed at cloudy sites. And uh, so it means that the mean daily DNI should not be the only indicator to use when evaluating the potential of the solar resource, since you have a lot more energy uh, during this kind of days. For decades, uh, we, we, we go into the typical meteorological years now, and this is a very useful tool, actually, uh, for many things, and that's why it has been developed in, uh, I would say, the 60s and 70s, and that was developed to help engineers to simulate solar system and building energy performance. So. A, a typical meteorological year 
convenient, conveniently replaces about 30 years of data with a single year, which is purely artificial. And some models of source system power output, uh, like PV watts or or SAM, the uh, from from NREL, actually still uh, rely heavily on TMI type data. And so we have to look into this a little bit more. Do do these uh, typical years do the job as far as DNI and the resource assessment is uh, concerned? So here we have. Um, a table showing the evolution of TMY data in the US from the earlier uh, TMYs uh, covering the period from 52 to 70, 75. Um, we also see what weight was given on global irradiance uh, to select the proper year and the weight given to DNI. In that case, that was zero and the number of stations for which uh, those uh, TMY data was available. So you see that in the earlier TMY data, there was no weight on DNI, but some good weight on global irradiance. That changed uh, later with the TMY2 data. Uh, the period was different, the weights were different, and a little bit more stations. Now the latest TMY3 data cover different periods actually, depending on station. The weight are still the same as TMY2, but the good news is that there are many more stations available. Although, uh, as I mentioned, some of these sites do not have the 30-year data basis. So, uh, these weights uh, are one thing. The other thing is that all the TMY data are based on uh, model data rather than measured data. So, this is another source of uncertainty. And also from this table, it sh shouldn't be construed that just because the numbering has changed, TMY3 is more advanced or better or more accurate than TMY2. And in fact, uh, what I found is that in general, TMY2 might be better than TMY3. So are TMY data appropriate for CSP or CPV applications? Well, maybe not. Uh, there are some potential drawbacks using TMYs. Uh, as I mentioned before, DNA in TMY data is at least 90%, 99% modeled. Uh, at clear sites, the TMI Howley distribution usually show discrepancies above 50, uh, 500 watts per square meter. So this is the case here for uh, Golden Colorado, where we have data from NREL. And you see the frequency distribution uh, of Howley DNI values between 0 and uh, 1100 watts. And this here at very low DNI is not much important, but uh, then the distribution goes well. The, the, the comparison is uh, quite well between the measured values in gray, the NSRDB 30-year uh, values in uh, green, actually uh, it's uh, 15 years here, and the TMY3 values in purple. So you see good agreement here in this uh, part of the plot. But then above about 500 or 600 watts, you see some uh, disagreement. And a reverse uh, situation here above 950 or so. So why is that? Uh, well, it has been... Uh, found that this is due to the use of climatological monthly values rather than discrete daily values for the aerosol data. And I would say this is a relatively uh, a general situation in many countries. So another thing is that TMY data are based on Howley values. Uh, this uh, might not be ideal for nonlinear systems, which have thresholds, like uh, they don't start until 
the DNI is more than 150 watts or 200 watts or 300 watts. Uh, this is something we looked at last week in the last presentation uh, about the short-term uh, variation in DNI. Another thing is that non-typical, which means low DNI years, are excluded from the data pool. Uh, so, because of, for example, of a, a big uh, volcanic eruption. So, using TMY for risk assessment is, well, risky. Um, so, this means that bankability of uh, use of TMY MY is uh, not really a uh, uh, thing, probably. The risk of bad years cannot be assessed correctly, and also the TMY may seriously overestimate the P90 exceedance probability. So here we have an example uh, for uh, Denver Golden again, uh, based this time on 30 years of data. Uh, excuse me, 15 years, and uh, the cumulative frequency in percent for all these 15 years in gray, so you have good years and bad years, and compared to the model in, gr in uh, dark gray or, or black, and team Y3 in, in red, and the measured data, measured values in green. So we have a relatively good agreement here and some disagreement there. Um, but the, the main thing is, as you see, you have a lot of scatter from one year to the other, which is uh, obviously not uh, reproduced in the TMY3 data. And if you plot all this in a different way, which is the annual DNI in kilowatt hour per square meter for uh, the annual average, the daily average. Well, the, the probability of exceedance goes from 100% at very low values. Of course, you, you have a 100% probability of uh, having more than this value here, and this probability decreases when the annual GNI, GNI uh, increases, and at some point you have a zero probability to be over the, the best possible year, which in this case is, is about 6 kilowatt hour per square meter. So in this case it happens that the TMY2 value, which is for a single year, uh, is right there at the median value of the, the probability of exceedance, which is 50%. So, for um, bankability where you require maybe uh, a P90, uh, you are far from it if you use the TMY. So, local measurements are obviously an essential part of the resource assessments. Uh, there are basically two types of weather stations and depending on the radiometer technology you want to use and I would say also your budget. Um, the minimum measurement period uh, I would say is one year um, because you have all the seasons. Uh, of course the performance and prices vary and, and so these two types of uh, measurement stations are here. This is the first type which is using uh, silicon-based radiometers, and in this case it's a rotating shadow band. Um, and uh, this is relatively autonomous, you have a, a PV panel for power, and the data is sent by uh, a modem. So this is the less expensive type of weather station. And the more expensive uses um, actually uh, thermal pile radiometers with a tracker, and so this requires a lot more electricity to 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 use. So basically, uh, this is known to be a reference 
because thermal piles are not sensitive to uh, spectral effects. But now I would say the uh, uh, these uh, rotating shadow bands are relatively well corrected for these spectral effects. So it's basically basically a matter of preference and budget. So what is the average annual resource of CSP and CPV compared to that of other solar technologies? Well, this has been uh, discussed in uh, this uh, paper here. Uh, and that's, uh, that introduced the solar resource and enhancement factor. And uh, we see here uh, some plots, uh, not very easy to read though. Um, for 222 US solar sites, uh, which are excluding Alaska. And here we compare the annual resource for uh, two axis concentrators, which is at, at the baseline of one. That's the reference. And we compare here one axis uh, concentrators with a, an east west uh, axis, which are in blue. Uh, one axis, but with a north south axis and a uh, flat on, on a horizontal ground and they are in brown here and finally one axis concentrators like uh, parabolic troughs and a north to south axis but with a tilt equal to the latitude and that is interesting because as you can see uh, for any latitude you have only a five percent derating factor between the two axis and the one axis but of course you need a slope equal to the latitude facing south which is not always obvious in this plot we have the um, same kind of information but uh, it's only for um, summertime We observe that latitude is not a good predictor for the solar resource. So if you compare the um, incident energy um, on two axis concentrators, compare them to latitude tilt flat plate collectors, you have this kind of plot uh, depending on, on latitude, which is not easy to see where and how and why uh, there are differences. So now uh, the same thing if you plot the uh, KT, which is the ratio of global horizontal to uh, extraterrestrial horizontal and KN, which is the same kind of ratio but for GNI. That's basically the, the atmospheric transmittance. So Again, uh, as a function of latitude, here uh, KD is always gr larger than KN, and you have variations between the most cloudy uh, site here, which is uh, Quillayut uh, in Washington state, close to the Canadian border, and the best site, which is uh, Daggett in California. So there's a large difference between those two sites, of course. But it's not a, a clean function of latitude. So there are other ways of um, looking at this. And this is through the, uh, rather than using latitude, it, it would be using those uh, uh, clearness ratios, if you want. So here, for example, we have same kind of plot as before but as a function of the annual KN value and this is interesting because you uh, if you are interested in CSP and CPV you also need to know your competition uh, and the competition will probably be from the flat plate PV collectors either on, on a fixed uh, tilt or fixed surface or on two axis trackers and those two axis trackers with flat plate PV, uh, 
do have a larger resource than CSP and CPV, and this is for a typical two-axis tracker flat plate uh, PV resource. And in cloudy weather, you can have 80% 80, 80 more than DNI. In very sunny weather, like Daggett, California, you still have about 25% more resource from a two-axis tracker uh, for flat plate. And then, also have now on the market, there are smart two-axis trackers that actually uh, do not follow the sun when it's uh, cloudy, but they track the best place in the sky. And uh, those uh, smart trackers can add another 5 to 15 percent, depending on cloudiness, to the uh, two-axis flat plate solar resource. So you might contemplate a 90 or 95 percent uh, difference between the two-axis flat plate solar resource compared to the two-axis DNI resource, which is big. So this is actually severe competition, and here this other plot shows uh, the difference or the ratio actually between uh, what you get for uh, the two-axis concentrator using DNI uh, to the flat plate latitude tilt, which is uh, th this value of 1, the reference. So only in these uh, very high GNI, uh, <coughs> very clean sites, you have about uh, 10 to 15 percent more solar resource than the latitude tilt flat plate P uh, PV. This obviously decreases and uh, in sites you have a lot less. So this is the competition. Now let's talk about circumsolar irradiance. Uh, and this is the definition, if you want. The, the scattering is typically very strong around the sun, uh, in, in, in sky around the sun. And so the sky close to the sun looks very bright. And this is actually diffuse radiation that behaves like direct radiation. And therefore that can be concentrated. So can we measure this? Well, it's a, a little bit difficult actually to measure that. It has been done many years ago. Uh, that was a research project of more than three. These people used um, a NIP, a standard A-play NIP per heliometer, and they added some tubes, limiting tubes, to uh, have a different uh, field of view, if you want, around the sun than the standard instrument. And they showed that, well, uh, obviously uh, circumsolar was, uh, could be important in some cases. Now, the routine measurements you obtain from uh, a standard pi heliometer, uh, those uh, routine measurements actually include uh, circumsolar irradiance within the field of view of instrument, which is from 2.5 to 2.9 degree from the sun center. So in other words, uh, the data, the DNI data you get from those instruments, they always slightly overestimate the true DNI that can be used for CSP and CPV, uh, especially where their concentration ratio is high, and therefore the subtended cone is smaller, uh, about one degree, smaller than the field of view of the instrument. So can, what can we do about this to, to know more about the circumstellar uh, energy? So the, the circumstellar radiance, which is the intensity of the energy at any point in the sky, that can be now measured. Uh, but this requires very specialized equipment. Uh, one such, uh, well, I think the only current instrument available on the market today is this one. It's called SAM and this tracks the sun and scans um, the from the sun center to 8 degrees from it. 
provides you with that kind of data, which is the, the radiance in uh, here in watts per square centimeter per uh, steradian and per micrometer. It's uh, spectral and angular values. And this is uh, during a day and uh, the red portion is from the sun and the blue portion is from the sky. So it, it changes all the time due to atmospheric uh, concentration in aerosols and, and the presence of clouds. So can we do some modeling? Uh, yes, uh, actually the clear sky circumstellar irradiance up to 10 degrees from the sun center can be modeled with SMARTS if the atmospheric input data is available. Now below 3 degrees uh, from the sun center it has been found that um, the circumstellar effect is uh, negligible under very clear condition. But it can also represent up to 5% of DNI under very hazy conditions like uh, what you would get in India or China. Now under thin cirrus clouds the circumstellar effect becomes uh, important and this is one such picture where we see very thin cirrus clouds around the Sun in a very bright uh, circumstellar area here and in that case it's difficult to model actually. So in this case uh, a large collection of uh, some measurements for example would be needed to develop simple empirical models and we are now trying to make such a research project possible in collaboration with the SAMS manufacturer as well as some US and European institutions. Now we have this um, uh, plot of um, uh, circumstellar radiance on a linear scale from the sun center at zero to about eight degree from the sun center here and you see this uh, kind of exponential decrease uh, which correspond to this picture where the sun obviously is in the center and how this, the bright area here uh, actually decreases from the sun center. So uh, what we find actually is that the, even the, the radiance of the sun's disk is not constant. Um, this is appearing here in this plot where the sun center is here right there and its radiance decreases slightly up to its edge here. And this, uh, this effect is called uh, the limb darkening effect. It's very normal. Now the, the second thing is that the sky radiance which starts here at the uh, sun's edge, it decreases exponentially. So on a logarithmic scale like we have here, uh, it will appear as a relatively uh, straight line. And here we have the case of a very clear sky and the case of a hazy sky and you see the difference. Obviously the, the hazy sky has also a lower irradiance and radiance on the disk itself. So uh, this is the kind of um, dynamic range if you want you have to deal with when you measure the radiance from very bright uh, sun uh, center and sun's disk to uh, the edge and the uh, start of of the blue sky or actually a bright sky. And this uh, dynamic range uh, decreases due to uh, aerosol loading. So the hazier it is, uh, the lower the dynamic range will be. And now when we have a cirrus cloud, which is the case here with two different cirrus clouds, well that dynamic range uh, is uh, again is a lot uh, lower. So this means that, and that's why here we have a lot more circumsolar irradiance up to, for example, this is the limit of uh, a standard power heliometer at about three degrees from the sun. So all this radiance energy will be measured by the instrument but 
what can you actually uh, concentrate is another story. It will be probably only a part of this. So uh, the slope of uh, the decrease is actually a function of the optical depth of the atmosphere, which is directly a function of the quantity of aerosols or clouds. And so this means that um, this uh, slope uh, will increase when you go from a very clear sky to a hazy sky and finally to a cloudy sky. And, uh, and uh, an interesting analogy is with the Monument Valley um, here where you have the same shape as the uh, Sun's disk and the sharp uh, decrease in uh, radiance and then another part here. Uh, on a spectral basis the circumstellar effect is more pronounced at shorter wavelength since this is caused by scattering and scattering is highly uh, wavelength dependent. Um, now the circumstellar to DNI fraction increases linearly with the opening angle. That, that's what we see here. Uh, this is the opening angle of a standard NIP, a play NIP per heliometer, uh, at about 3 degrees from the sun center. And this is uh, what you actually get into the measurements uh, due to the circumstellar effect. So for very low AOD, very clear skies, you get only a fraction of a percent of circumstellar within the field of view of the instrument. But when the uh, AOD increases and it's, it becomes hazy, then you can get up to 2 to 3 percent um, uh, circumstellar within the DNI. It's, it would be a lot more in, in the case of cirrus cloud, but as I said before, it's very difficult to model. So, those uh, things, and also it's, uh, it's a function of air mass. Air mass here is 1, 1.5, 2, and 3. So, you see that when air mass increases, the fraction of circumstellar also increases. Um, I hope that more results would be presented at the next uh, CPV conference uh, next year. Now let's look at uh, the spectral irradiance. Uh, this is a very well-known phenomenon and that, that will be more of interest to CPV people of course now. The direct spectrum redshift when the air mass increases or when the aerosol uh, turbidity or aerosol optical depth uh, increases. And this is shown here uh, in a case for uh, Golden Colorado where we have uh, spectral measurements every five minutes. So this is a clear day and uh, we start here uh, af just after sunrise and then the sun goes up and reaches its uh, maximum altitude here uh, with this plot and this is compared to the extraterrestrial irradiance. So you clearly see that from for a very low air mass uh, high sun you have uh, your typical maximum here at about 500 uh, nanometer or something like that and when the sun is very low uh, well you have a very important redshift to the uh, near infrared actually. Same kind of things occurs when you increases when you increase the the aerosol optical depth. Here uh, we have a comparison between the older standard from ASTM uh, E891 for DNI and this was the, the standard that was uh, uh, released in uh, 1987. Uh, with a maximum here. Uh, the new standard uh, G173 also from ASTM, it's from, uh, it was uh, released in 2003 and it has a lower AOD and therefore the spectrum is quite different. 
This is again the extraterrestrial spectrum EM0. So below 700 nanometers, the atmospheric extension is dominated by scattering from molecules and aerosols. Above that limit, it is actually dominated by absorption, essentially from water vapor and CO2. So there are uh, reference uh, air mass 1.5 spectra that have been standardized by ESTM um, in 87 and 03, as I mentioned. They, they also have uh, been standardized by um, institutions like ESO and uh, IEC. Uh, that latter spectrum from 2003 was specially designed for CPV, but I, I'm not sure, I don't think it has been actually uh, standardized as such for a CPV rating. Hello. So, we have interest in uh, spectral irradiance for CPV applications, but the problem is that spectral measurements are difficult and costly. There are not many sites where you can get this. Uh, so, the obvious uh, possibility is to switch to spectral modeling. And uh, this is possible with some existing codes. And uh, one uh, of uh, the most well known is SMARTS. Uh, it has been used to develop the uh, ASTM standards. And uh, so, using it is interesting because you can actually relate directly to those standards even though you can change uh, the uh, atmospheric conditions. Now obviously the uh, any any PV cell has a strong spectral selectivity. So what we can do with SMARTS actually is two different things. Uh, you can calculate spectral mismatch correction factors and that's that's being done routinely for that plate PV, for example, and you can also uh, calculate the output of multi-junction, uh, like triple junction cells, under variable spectral conditions. Here in this plot, we have uh, the external quantum efficiency of a silicon cell, crystalline silicon, uh, that can be used for. Um, low concentration ratios uh, in CPV and, the, for example, this kind of um, tracker here uh, has a 4 kilowatt uh, silicon-based, uh, uh, silicon modules and uh, also provide a 3 sun uh, concentration. And this is from JX crystals. So this is the kind of uh, silicon cell they would use. Now, for high concentration ratios, which is the trend now, uh, uh, CPV, the trend also is to use those uh, triple junctions. Uh, here is uh, one of them from spect Spectral Lab. So we have the first layer, second layer, third layer, and you see that it, it extends its sensitivity to the to the infrared. So the problem is that. Uh, you have uh, limiting currents uh, things, so you need to calculate the spectral... You have to combine the spectrum of the sun at, at any moment with the spectral selectivity of, of the cells and calculate each of these three things separately. So the multi-junction cells have a typical 40 or 41 percent efficiency for high concentration PV, whereas the silicon cell is less efficient but also less costly and that's for low concentration PV. You can calculate the daily average direct spectrum with this kind of formula which is um, obtained numerically and you can also calculate the daily spectral enhancement factor uh, with this even more um, complex formula. Uh, so this has been done for different sites in the world, for example between a very clear site at Izana uh, in the west of Africa, very high altitude site, uh, 
Um, moderate clean site at Kashidu in the Maldives, uh, west of India, and Kampur, which is in northern India, where the it's a very uh, hazy atmosphere there. So you have for January, for example, you see the difference in in the daily uh, average uh, DNI, and your ASTM G133. Uh, air mass 1.5 would be here. It's a constant, obviously. In July, the, situ the situation is different. Um, there is more aerosol in the sky. It's also more usually uh, um, uh, mid, so you have uh, less DNI compared to the January situation, but the, the day is longer. So, with all this information, you can calculate a daily spectral enhancement factor. And um, this is another example uh, for another site in Solar Village. Um, uh, you see the different spectra for each month of the year, how they change. So these kind of um, results appear in, in these papers. And that we uh, observe that for any type of solar cell, the spectral effect is a strong function of AOD. So when AOD increases from very clean to very hazy sites, your spectral effect is almost linearly uh, dependent on that and can reach uh, 20%, which is quite high. And this is another way of presenting the, those between a relatively uh, hazy site here, Solar Village, and a very cl a relatively clean site, um, La Parguera. So, and all this is only due to the spectral effect. So, one goal of the current R&D uh, situation is to fine-tune the multi-junction cells by optimizing their band gap combinations so that uh, they would respond optimally optimally to the original average spectrum. And that could be interesting because uh, then you might have this kind of difference in the annual power output. But again, the cirrus clouds, like for circumsolar, the cirrus clouds appear to affect the performance of CPV modules. Uh, the problem is that at this point we are not sure if it's because of the spectral effect or the circumsolar effect, or both. So this has been discussed in that paper. Now, the conclusions for the actually for the two different webinars the dni solar resource is highly variable uh, projecting it to 20 or 30 years is still difficult all radiation measurement are the best source of data but you need to do something uh, to guarantee uh, the quality of the data for a long time and this um, means a lot of good calibration maintenance uh, quality control, and if the local DNI measurements are only available for a short period, uh, then that has to be uh, used in conjunction with long-term model data and do some local adjustment to the time series. The use of TMY data is not recommended, and particularly for nonlinear operation like uh, in CSP where you have a startup threshold. And in that case, actually, sub hourly time series are ideal. Spe circumsolar and spectral effects have a second order importance, but should be studied for better simulation and possibly for fine tuning of CPV uh, cells. The benefit of a larger circumsolar contribution to low concentration PV system cannot be evaluated yet. We don't have the models. And finally, because of the lack of high quality measured data, uh, DNI data in the public domain, the science of resource assessment cannot only progress slowly. So this concludes
uh, the, the two webinars on this topic. Thank you. Okay, Chris, thank you very much for your presentation. A comprehensive view of this um, solar resource assessment, so not as simple as uh, we can figure out initially. Thank you very much. So um, we can now go for discussion. So um, let me check the questions that you have been sending. Uh, you can you can submit them uh, from now. Uh, we will be uh, answering one by one. So do not hesitate to to write your your questions in the Q and A pod. So in the meanwhile, let me check whether we have already. Okay, so let's go for a first question. So, um, where do solar towers measure up in performance dependence on DNI variation compared to CSP, CPV, and two axis flat? Um, Chris, hope the question is clear. You can go ahead. Um. That I think from the question that is uh, has nothing to do with the solar resource. Uh, uh, solar towers use DNI and um, this is, uh, CPV or CSP also use DNI. Uh, the difference would be between and again uh, concentrating on on the solar resource aspect of things. Uh, there are obviously technological aspects of that, which are completely different. From the solar resource pers perspective, the DNI is completely used by solar towers or two-axis trackers in general. But for one-axis trackers, like you have with the uh, parabolic troughs, then the situation is different, and they use less than the solar resource and that that was uh, that that's what i showed with the uh, solar resource enhancement factors for one axis versus two axis trackers so you have less uh, resource if you use only one axis uh, like uh, with a unless as i mentioned it is oriented north to south and also it has uh, latitude tilt which would be quite difficult Okay, thank you very much, Chris. So um, let's go for another question. Could you please clarify the doubling of COV for increasing the probability levels? Um, well, it's a pure statistical thing. Um, if you if you look at statistics, you know that the standard deviation represents only a 66% probability of being distance from the mean. If you want 95% uh, absolute, if you want uh, assurance that you are within uh, that d uh, distance from the mean, then you need to double it. That's that's pure uh, statistic. Okay, so we have another question. So your examples of measuring stations do not use fire heliometers. Do you think it's good enough without them? Thank you. Oh, actually, I, I showed example with power heliometers, uh, of course. Yes. Uh, if you want to measure, if you want to, if you are interested in DNI, you need that kind of data uh, for sure. I just uh, mentioned a few sites uh, measuring global only uh, about the long-term variation, the trends, because the, 
they have to be we don't have that kind of GNI data but uh, you need GNI data for sure either measured or modeled okay thank you Chris Another question, what approach or sources do you suggest to get DNI data for India, where on-ground data are limited? Um, well, because actually, we discussed the case of India. Uh, we discussed the, the case of India last time, and I showed uh, solar radiation maps, uh, the, the newest maps that NREL uh, released a few months ago. So this would be uh, uh, the first step, I would say. Uh, as you mentioned, there are not much uh, measurement over there. So um, besides that, there are different other sources, depending on the special resolution you need. Some are free, and obviously there are commercial vendors also. And so I, I would say you can start with NREL and then uh, look uh, other sources. There are there are ma many sources actually. The problem is to to know which one is closest to the truth, and unfortunately, we don't know yet. Okay, thank you, Chris. So everything is to be built in the coming years. That's um, well a good. Uh, avenue for uh, jobs and uh, research. So another question from Aladdin Master Institute. Can you elaborate more on how to estimate the spectral radiance by using um, smart? Uh, if you go back to the presentation, um, just let me. Well, know. I don't think it's uh, necessary. Obviously, the first thing is to obtain smarts and. Uh, there are links from our website, and it is currently hosted by NREL, but uh, you can go to our website to, to have the correct links. Um, then, SMARTS is basically a model in which you input some data that represent the atmospheric conditions. And the most important ones are the aerosol optical depth. Uh, you can calculate the solar position from the date and time, or you can impose that. Uh, you must also enter some values about uh, water vapor, uh, pressure, or uh, site elevation. And uh, have a lot of things you can play with, but that, that, um, be, that that's basically the, the most important inputs to the model. So the difficulty in many cases is to get those data that represent the atmospheric conditions but they are yes chris uh, can you are you still there? Oh, sorry, I, I okay. shut down the, the microphone. Do you hear me? Okay, so you can... Yes, yes. Um, did you hear uh, my answer to that question? Uh, it was... Um... Here, we hear but 50%, uh, so if okay. you can um, um, resume, please. Okay, so you, you, you need basically to describe the atmospheric conditions, and uh, the most important variables or inputs are the aerosol optical depth, uh, water vapor, ozone, um, pressure or elevation of the site, uh, and when you know time, the, the code will calculate the solar position. So with all this information, it will provide you with the irradiance, which is actually direct, diffuse, global, and circumsolar, and also uh, irradiance on a tilted surface, if you need, or a two-axis tracking surface. 
and um, that will be from 280 nanometers to 4000 nanometers so all the short wave uh, spectrum will be covered and the, the uh, spectral resolution varies from 0.5 nanometer in the UV to 5 nanometers in the, in the infrared. So, uh, okay. Very you, well. You, you Thank can you. Go, you can go to our yes. website to get the links because it is hosted by NREL at this point. Okay. okay. So we have another uh, question from Marcus Schmidt. So, um, if we have a flat PV yield data. Is it possible to uh, estimate DNI data? So the question exactly is, is it possible to correlate flat PV panel yield data to DNI data? Yes, it Thank is you. possible. Um, maybe, Fernando, if we could go back to the presentation, then uh, it could be clearer. Indeed. Let me... moment yes so you can navigate the slides so, and I think it would be f slide 15 let's try this one so here on this plot you see the ratio between two axis concentrator resource compared to reference at one, which is uh, the, your latitude tilt flat plate. So not very clear today, last week. Um, so. Basically, and this is a function of uh, the ratio between the diffuse to global irradiance uh, on a an, uh, manual average basis. So here we have very clear sites like Daggett, California, and here we have very clear sites like in Washington State. So this is a typical ratio, and as you can see, it is quite well behaved. So from there, if you have your resource for your latitude tilt flat plate, you simply need to know this uh, ratio here, which is uh, based on uh, some resource maps, for example, or for or whatever, and and then you will gain your GNI. Um, relationship here. So this is a way to do it and since your uh, PV output is essentially proportional to the resource, well the same should be true uh, for the axis concentrator for example. Okay, Chris, thank you very much. So let's uh, now come back to the questions and let's see other. So, next question from Maria Martinez What are the corrections to make? long-term satellite models using the measured data Thank well that that's a uh, that's a tough question actually it's uh, it's not it's not easy uh, hear me correctly now okay um, yes there's a lot of feedback so yeah this is a relatively uh, complex um, technique I would say, 
because it's uh, based on uh, meteorological models and uh, techniques. So it's not something that most engineer would do. Uh, techniques and uh, it, it would be a, a lot too long to discuss here actually. But obviously uh, we, we can do Uh, yes, Chris, I think uh, we lost again the sound. Can you repeat, please? Um, Make sure. Yeah, there is probably a failing connection. You didn't hear anything of, of my answer? Do you hear me? Ah, uh, okay. Almost. <laughs> yes. Now, yes. So just make sure that uh, all the flags are okay. Yeah, so I, I said it, it's, it's a complex question. It's a. Uh, uh, relatively um, involved technique. Uh, it is based on research in the meteorological area and uh, those guys use very specific techniques for that kind of thing. So it's not it's not something I can discuss in a few seconds. Uh, it's uh, quite involved and uh, typically experts uh, like us can do that for clients. Um, but it's not something that is um, can be done easily. Okay, great. Thank you, Chris. So we have another question. So assuming that hazy conditions occur that diffuse the sunlight, would the solution be as simple as enlarging a secondary concentrator? For concentrating trough or dish to collect the circumsolar radiation that would otherwise not be collected? Uh, that, you. Yeah, that's uh, you hear me now. Eh? Uh, this is an this is yep. an interesting question, and um, actually many many people ask this question to me. Um, the idea is to collect some diffuse radiation, of course. The problem is that. Um, under very clear sky conditions, like let's say the southwest US or South Africa or some other uh, Australia, you know, where the sky is so clean, uh, the diffuse radiation is very little. So maybe only 50 watts per square meter. So even though you can collect a part of this, it will be very small anyway. And at the same time, your DNI is probably around a thousand watts. So, if you can collect ten more watts by doing a lot of things on the technology side, you will not gain a lot. So, uh, that idea would only be of interest in very hazy conditions. And I speak of India or China, for example, or maybe this uh, is in uh, northern or western Africa where there's a lot of haze. And then the diffuse is a, a lot more, it's increased a lot and, and actually DNI is a lot less. So in those conditions you might be, you might have some interest in doing that. But uh, I would say it's only advisable for low concentration ratios. Uh, the, the current trend now in uh, CPV is to, to use uh, multi-junction cells, which are extremely expensive. So you have uh, optical concentration of uh, uh, up to a thousand suns, and that means a very um, little, a very small uh, field of view for the concentrator, uh, typically uh, one degree or less from the sun. So in those conditions, uh, you, you cannot get much diffuse. So again, uh, this this could be interesting for low concentration devices in very hazy uh, spots. Okay, thank you, Chris. So we have uh, another question. So given current satellite remote sensing models for estimating solar resources, how many DNI and GHI 
solar measurement stations are needed in the US and other nations to support solar industry? Ah, uh, Tom, you. this is <laughs> a good question. Uh, well, uh, I don't know the answer yet, but certainly a lot more than what we have. Um, I think in West we have, what, maybe 20 stations with the public domain data for DNR. I would say an order of magnitude more would help, definitely. The, the, the problem actually is in, um, in regions where we don't have anything at this point, or almost anything. I'm, I'm um, thinking, for example, um, parts of uh, Australia and, and um, China, or, you know, sometimes there, there are measurements, but it's not in the public domain. So. Uh, it is two different things. Uh, having more stations is one, and guaranteeing that the, the measured data will be available to scientists is another one. The current trend is that the industry does uh, the, um, the measurements and buys the equipment and obviously keep the data proprietary to them so that uh, we scientists do not have access to that I and mean, it's like it's lost essentially for science so there are, there are two different things uh, more stations and also more transparency for the data okay thank you chris so i think uh, we have to adjourn so Thank you very much everybody for your participation. Thank you Chris for this uh, great uh, presentation. Um, okay, so I think we have uh, probably a last question. So let me let me send it very quickly. So a question for power plant simulation. The solar radiation data is the most important. Nevertheless, dry and wet bulb temperature become important and critical for dry cooling power plants. These data are more reliable than the DNA data using TMY data. Um, well, uh, I don't know if the question is clear, Chris. Yeah, uh, yes, it is clear. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't know what to say about this because I... Actually, I, I never tried to look at the temperature data in the TMY. I assume that the variability is less than in DNI, but still, obviously, there are uh, cold and uh, warm years, so there is, there is some variability. And so I assume that it is less a problem than in DNI, but it could be a problem, of course. But somebody else has to look at this. Uh, I, I have not done that yet. Okay. Okay. Great. So thank you very much, Chris. Uh, for our audience, um, the link indicated there. Uh, you will find the you will find today's presentation, and in some hours the recording of today's webinar. Thank you to all. You have also. Uh, the contact data for Chris, uh, his website, and you can also join our uh, professionals community on LinkedIn uh, if you want further network uh, among you. So yes, uh, thank you very much for your participation. We will probably be doing more series on um, CSP in the coming months, so uh, you will be notified. And uh, while well, Chris, I I give you the floor to close the session. Thank you. Well, thank you, Fernando, and thank you to all. And I really appreciated those questions. Uh, if you have uh, more questions or more information uh, from, you know, we answer that offline, of course. And I hope I I wish the best to all in their projects now. Thank you. Thank you so much.